so quiet in here. Hear a pin drop. It is comfortable. How's everyone doing today? Good? Welcome to the Chrysler Museum Glass Studio. My name is Robin Rogers. I'm the assistant manager here at the studio. I'm going to be your narrator for the next hour or so. It's a very special day here in our studio. We do demonstrations every day, Tuesday through Sunday, which are totally free at noon, which you're here at the right time. Um, most days it's our team doing uh, some sort of glass process, showing you how some of the things in the collection were created, so on and so forth. But just a couple times a year, we have special presentations during these times when we bring in uh, world-renowned glass artists to work in our space, and this happens to be one of those times. We're very thrilled and excited and uh, fortunate to have working here in our studio, Mr. Micah Evans. Can you help me in joining a little round of applause? So Micah has been um, working with glass since about 99, and he's originally from Washington State, grew up in the shadow of Mount St. Helens. Um, he's worked around the world in various different studios and places, and he currently lives and works in Austin, Texas. And he specializes in a, a technique called flame working, and that's the process that you see uh, happening out here. And I'm going to tell you all about flame working. I'm going to tell you about some other glass processes during this next um, hour, and we're going to watch Micah as he's working on one of his creations here. Has anyone been to one of these demonstrations before? Maybe our, our regular, regular demo? or how many, of the, how many of you is the first time in our studio? Oh wow, great, look at all those hands. Well thanks for coming in today. Hopefully you'll learn something new about glass. We are part of the education department of the museum, so it's our mission to educate all of you about glass as a material and about how, again, how objects are made. Some of the objects you see over there, and you'll get to see how Micah makes some of his work here. I will mention, um, I probably mentioned a couple times, that in addition to the demonstrations, we offer classes here. You guys can come back and take classes and uh, learn firsthand about glass making. We have a wide variety of classes. I'll show you what the catalog looks like. This is the course catalog. You can pick one of these up on your way out if you want. It's also online at Chrysler.org. These classes range from short little hour-long sessions five years old and up, almost anyone can do them. You get to experience the material. Our very talented studio team intervenes to make sure that you don't burn yourself or that you get to take something home that you're gonna cherish for the rest of your life. But you get, you get a first-hand experience with the material. So those are the short session classes. We have longer classes that take a whole weekend, but you get to learn every single step of the process. So these classes typically are 16 years old and up. And then if you find that you really like it, you don't have to build all this equipment in your garage, you can come back, you can rent our studio equipment to continue your practice with glass or maybe start your second career. Who knows, it could, be, it could become your new thing. But uh, as I mentioned, I'll talk about some of the different uh, processes as we go. Today we're gonna focus here on flame working too. Does anybody know what glass is or where glass even comes from? We're just gonna start from scratch. What's glass made of, do you know? You want to guess? Maybe not. Did your hand go up? Do you know what glass is made of? Sand. That's absolutely correct. Um, just about every type of glass there is has a base of sand or what's known as silica. It's a specific type of sand. But that's the basis for pretty much every glass out there. You add other materials to that sand to get it to melt in different ways, to get it to turn different colors, and to create different types of glass. But for all intents and purposes, all all glass uh, starts with sand. The glass uh, that Mike is using today is a, a specific type of glass. It's called borosilicate glass. You guys might know it as the brand name Pyrex. Uh, so it's a very specific type of glass that's well suited for this process of working in this hot open flame here. So the flame that he's working on is uh, fueled by propane and oxygen. And that flame is about, the blue flame that you see there is about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit or so. It's pretty hot, okay? Glass melts at just above 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, so that's, that's pretty hot too. And Mike has been doing some, what we call prep work this morning. He's been creating all these little 
uh, bubbles you see here with these little black lines. Can you guys see those little black lines running through them? And it's been kind of a tedious process. He started about just about uh, 10 o'clock. So in two hours, he's made all of these, which is it's pretty good. And the black lines that he's putting on there are going to be part of the patterning and the, and the piece that he's going to be constructing. So this process is a fairly slow process, but it's rewarding. The amount of detail that he's able to put into what he's creating is uh, it's a, it's a very high amount of detail. So the, the end result of what he's working on here, I'm going to borrow your drawing, it's going to be a starling, a bird. And it's going to be about life size, pretty similar to the size you see on his drawings here. He sketched it out for reference. And I'll just walk it around for you guys. This bird is going to be hollow. So it'll be a hollow uh, bubble, a hollow form. Um, the feet, which he'll add later, those will be solid. But the, the main body will be hollow. And then the, the black lines, you don't see them in the drawing here, but he's been adding this patterning to these bubbles. The, the patterning will be on the bird's body when he's finished. And what he's doing with that patterning is he's referencing topographical maps. Who's ever heard of or seen a topographical map? Anybody? You know what that is? You ever seen a map that's got a bunch of little lines on it? It kind of looks like this right here. So that's actually a glass sculpture that he made in reference to a topographical map. So they're maps that, they're flat, they're on a piece of paper, but by looking at the map you can tell how high something is, how high a mountain is, or how high a hill is. It talks about elevation and changes in elevation, okay? I mentioned that, uh, that Micah grew up near Mount St. Helens in Washington. It's very mountainous in Washington. And from a very early age, he was interested in geology. And he also saw some, some of these topographical maps from an early age, and he's always liked to look at them and reference them. Uh, he told me anytime he moves to a new place or goes to visit a new place, he'll, he'll look at a topographical map just to get the lay of the land, literally the way the land is, is laid out. And then more recently, he's been responding to um, these maps and creating his own sculpture. And in the sculpture, he is referencing um, both actual places as well as kind of infusing his own memories and preserving memories in these spots. So for instance, the one and this uh, piece here is a hill that's near Penland, North Carolina, and he told uh, told us a little bit earlier that he used to live right about here on this hill or near, near this hill. So it has a, a very specific uh, connection to, to his life, this specific place. It's also a beautiful design and a beautiful sculptural uh, form. So he's going to bring in this idea of the topographical uh, into the design onto the bird. So the bird will have this patterning on it, referencing the maps. And the birds also have a very interesting story that hopefully I can retell. He told it a little bit earlier. Where he grew up, um, he grew up near a lot of apple orchards and cherry trees. If you're familiar with Washington State, they're known for apples and cherries, right? And, and onions and things like that. But um, his friend's father had cherry, specific tree or grove or? Just one tree. Just one tree. One. Rainier cherries or? Yeah. Those beautiful kind of uh, yellowish, they're, they're not full red, they're yellow red, kind of beautiful, delicious reindeer cherries. And he had a problem with these birds that would eat all the cherries. And were they starlings? Yeah. Specifically starlings, they'd come through and help themselves just before he was gonna harvest. And so, uh, this he would pay Micah and his buddy, who had BB guns, to shoot the starlings and they would get a quarter for every one they took out. So he's made a series of these in the past. Um, although, have you ever done any with the pattern you know? No. One, the, one test. One test, okay. In the, in the past, he's done them just out of clear glass, but he makes these beautiful starlings. They're dead. And they're clutching a quarter. And they're hollow, and then he fills them, once they're cold, with BBs. And he does a little bit of uh, surface um, sandblasting to give it a little matte surface. Stuff. So he's made uh, work similar to this in the past, but he hasn't actually added brought in this topographical element. So he's developing new work um, before your very eyes here today. Uh, but it's really interesting, I think, the, the story of these starlings and, and their quarters. 
you know, and it's a beautiful sculptural form. So he has, um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, around 10 of these bubbles with the lines on them. And at this point, um, he's gonna start to change them from just being these round forms into different parts of the bird. And then those parts are gonna come together at, to form the whole of the bird. He's using this little tiny torch. It's a pinpoint flame. It allows him to very specifically heat that one little spot. And what he's done there is he's, he's popped a hole. Because these are all hollow and they all have, the end is open so you can blow through and add air pressure inside. He heated that one spot, he popped the hole, and then he reamed it out so that that one has a smaller than a dime. It's a, it's a very small, not a tiny hole, but a smallish hole. That hole is a spot where another part is going to come together and get attached at some point. Now, I've never seen him make one of these, so I'm just going to kind of make stuff up as we go along until it turns into the bird. <laughs> but um, let's see, I want to make sure we cover all the basic parts that we were talking about. So the torch is fired with propane and oxygen. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of factors that go into working with the glass. The glass is only going to move and flow when it's hot. Since he's putting these two parts together, he needs to, he, he heated those two um, openings up and stuck them together. But right now, where they've been put together is what's kind of known as a cold seal. They went together a little bit on the cold side, and if he just leaves that out, it's, it's, as it cools down, it's likely to crack in that spot. So he's gonna take a moment and go around that connection of the two and really melt them together so they totally flow together. If anyone's ever done welding, um, a process of welding out there, when you weld something, it's very important that the two pieces of metal you welded together both get nice and hot so the weld can penetrate and make purchase into each piece of metal. And if one of the pieces of metal is not hot enough, it's on the colder side, it won't penetrate and you'll have a, a bad weld that'll crack. Exact same thing here. <laughs> this is the nature of the material. Hung on. You planned that, didn't you? I wish. Um, glass does crack all the time. It's a very brittle material. The um, one thing I will kind of talk about with glass is that as glass heats up, it expands. It, it physically grows a little bit. And as it cools off, it shrinks. It physically contracts a little bit. It's a very small amount, but it actually grows and, it's, and it shrinks. And if it goes through that process of expansion and then contraction uh, too quickly, it will crack. It builds up stress and it ends up cracking. So we always have to be careful and to avoid uh, that cracking, we heat things slowly and we cool them off slowly. Now, depending on the type of glass you're using, um, you can go a little bit faster through this process. So I mentioned that he's using what's called borosilicate glass, okay? And you may know this is Pyrex. It's a very thermally shock resistant glass. So he can pretty quickly take something, especially because these aren't very thick, and go directly into that flame and uh, heat it up pretty rapidly. Now, we have a furnace over here. It's actually not on right now. This is the one time a year we shut the furnace off. But if you have ever been here for another noon demonstration, you may have seen this furnace on. And inside this furnace is typically a pool of molten glass, like 500 pounds. The type of glass we melt in the furnace is called soda lime glass. So it's a little different than the borosilicate glass. And it's not as thermally shock resistant. So if if he was to be working with tubing that was made out of the soda lime glass, he would have to be heating it much more slowly and working much more gently to, in order to keep it from cracking. So one of the uh, properties of this uh, borosilicate glass is the ability to heat it quickly and cool it quickly without having that cracking. Now anytime you heat glass up and cool it off, there's always a certain amount of stress inside the glass if it cools too quickly. So even though um, he's going to make this bird and it might actually go all the way down to room temperature so you could hold it in your hand, there'll still be some stress inside. So there's a process that will take place at the end, it's called annealing. And what that means is we're going to put the final piece into a, an electric kiln that's living over there. And the kiln sits at uh, about 1000 degrees, 1050 for this type of glass. 
We'll put it in that kiln. We'll let it sit in there for about 15, 20 minutes so that the whole, every piece of it gets to be that temperature. It's all kind of like happy with itself. And then we'll go very slowly from there so it all cools at the same rate and relieves all that stress. So glass, um, another really interesting thing about glass is that even at room temperature, glass is more similar to a liquid than a solid. Did you guys know that? If you look under, uh, under a microscope, its molecules have a random arrangement. Now most solids, pretty much any other solid, if you look at it, uh, whether it be steel or quartz or anything, under a microscope, its molecules are very orderly arranged in a very ge geometric way, which is why solids are solid, they're strong. Um, and if you look at liquids under a microscope, for instance, you know, water in its liquid state, uh, the molecules are in a random arrangement. Glass, even when it appears to be solid, we can hold it in our hands, the molecules still have a random arrangement. For that reason, uh, it's called an amorphous solid, it's, and it's actually more similar to a liquid than a solid. So what he's doing is he's one by one taking these um, smaller bubbles, attaching them to the bigger bubble, and then kind of heating and bringing those things together. And you see he's going back and forth between this larger flame and this smaller flame. One of the great things about this process of flame working or working in this torch is the ability to very specifically heat certain areas of the glass because the glass is only going to move and change where it's hot. And so if you can really specifically con uh, control where it's getting hot, you can have more control over what it's doing generally. And he kind of builds the heat up. Um, he wants to make sure it has a nice even heat before he adds any air pressure or anything like that because if it were, for instance, hotter on one side and colder on the other and he blows into it like he just did there, the hotter side would blow thinner and the colder side would stay thicker and then he'd have an uneven bubble. And depending what you make, you, there might be an instance where you want it to be thinner on one side, but Kind of generally speaking, uh, we're typically trying to keep a nice even wall thickness throughout the form. That way when it cools off, it's going to cool evenly as well and, and avoid all that stress we were just talking about. So again, coming in with this small hand torch, you can pinpoint one area, he blows. It kind of expands out and then he can pop it. Now there's an opening there. He's going to use a small little metal reamer to open that to the proper size. And now he's ready to put another section on there. So he's sort of montaging all these um, smaller sections together. And the lines are starting to interact and, and reference that um, topography we were talking about. If anybody has a question at any point, please feel free to uh, get my attention. If you have a question specifically for Micah, I can relay that to him. We'll kind of let him have some, some space as he's focusing here. I'm going to see if I can find a picture of one of these starlings he's made in the past so you guys can get an idea. How did he get the lines on it? That's a great question. She said, how did he get the lines on it? So he has, let me just actually back up and kind of start from the beginning of this process. I'm going to grab what the tubing looks like when we get it. So this is what borosilicate tubing looks like when you purchase it. It's made in a factory. We buy it in uh, cases, so it comes in a box of, you know, this size tubing would probably have 24 in a case. We take this tubing, heat it in that torch, so it heats one spot in the middle, and then pull and stretch it. So it tapers down. So it'd be this, this diameter would taper down and then get this diameter again. You do that on both sides and you've created what's called a point. This is what a point looks like right here. Follow me so far? So we take this and by heating and stretching down we make these. Because this is way too big to work with. You need to break it down into something that's more uh, feasible to work with. Okay? Now, from there, in order to get those lines on it, He has some black glass. It looks like this. 
Now the black glass came uh, in a little larger size rod, about like this, and then he heated it up and stretched it down to be this diameter. Is this straight black or is there clear underneath it's clear? So he actually put uh, the black on the outside of clear. So if you were to look down the center of this, it has a clear core. Now one way he could make those lines or the rings around would be to just heat this up and in the flame, wrap it around and draw lines here, 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 all the way down. He could do that, but you can see that these lines are fully melted in. They're not standing on the surface. They've been fully melted into the glass. And if he just drew on the surface and then melted that into the glass, because there's clear glass underneath, the black would melt into that clear and it would get diluted and it would get a little bit wider and he wouldn't have a nice super crisp line like he has here. So he wants that nice crisp line. So the only way he was able to get the nice crisp line was by taking this uh, and basically um, making a small constriction and then burning it off and opening both sides so he had two small cups lining one side with the black it's called a lip wrap a little wrap on the lip and then putting the two back together so if you were to look at a cross section of these where the black is it's in between two sections of clear but it's not on top of them does that make sense so again he goes through that process to keep those lines nice and crisp and sharp excellent question that's a great question. She's asking if the black um, heats up faster than the clear, behaves differently than the clear. And have you worked with glass before? <laughs> I took an intro class at Tidewater. Okay, she's taking an intro class at Tidewater Community College. The um, all types of glass and all colors of glass have their own properties and kind of personalities. So a lot of times, darker colors heat up faster. They're softer, they behave differently than the clear uh, or, or whatever color you're mixing it with. So you do have to, uh, your mica has to accommodate for that. And you're absolutely correct. Uh, although it's interesting because in borosilicate glass, for whatever reason, sometimes some of the darker colors, there's like dark blues and they're very stiff and they don't heat up as quickly. And some of the other colors, like some of the whites are very soft. But in the soda lime glass, the whites are very stiff and the dark, dark blue is one of the softest colors. So uh, the colors all have their own properties and you have to get to know each specific color and how it reacts. And then you have to um, adapt your process to react to that color. Let me see if I can bring up a picture. bring this up on the screen. Let's see if I can zoom in. These are the starlings clutching the quarters. They're clutching actual quarters and they're full of BBs. Do you think you'll put the BBs in these as well? Um, I think so. Yeah. You gotta go track down some BBs. You just gotta find some, anybody got some BBs out there? <laughs> now, this would happen cold later on, but. Yeah, you'll shoot your eye out. <laughs> okay, so. He has a solid rod in his right hand now. And he's heated up one spot there and made an attachment with that solid rod. He's gonna actually burn the other side off. And he's gonna, so he's transferring that whole bubble to what's called a punty. And that solid rod is his punty. 
it's pretty interesting because um, if you have ever seen a glass blowing demo here or in Jamestown or if you've tried it at TCC so on and so forth usually we have a bench and we have all these various tools like all these whole host of tools when you work with the torch a lot of your tools are just the glass itself so like for instance in the hot shop over here the punty would be a metal rod with glass on the end of it but with the torch the punty is just simply a glass rod that you heat up and, and stick on so by you may have seen he put the punty at a very specific angle that was sort of an off axis from the angle of the axis that he was working on and the reason for doing that is he's changed the axis which is going to change the relationship of the lines to the next uh, addition We can go back to the camera now. Go back to the camera. You guys have any other questions at this point? Yes. How do you make colored glass? So that's a great question. We know that glass is made of what? Sand, right? Sand, um, soda ash, and lime is the main ingredients in 99% of the glass, well no, no, probably, I don't know what percentage, but most of the glass you're going to encounter on a daily life is silica, soda, ash, and lime. If you add metal oxide, so there's something called cobalt, cobalt oxide, you want to guess what color that might turn the glass? Any guess? You ever heard that? Green, almost. You ever heard that word cobalt, but red, no? Thing? Blue, cobalt blue. You ever heard that? It's a type of blue. It's like a dark blue. So cobalt oxide gives you cobalt blue. Um, if you want to make green, you would add iron. And if you want to make red and pink, you add gold oxide. Some of the color we use has gold oxide or silver nitrate. So some of the colors we use um, have precious metals. And they're kind of very expensive colors. But that's a very good question. You can mix different metal oxides together to get a variety of different colors. Most glass artists these days, um, with the exception of a few, typically just buy glass color and, and apply it to their work. There are still some artists out there that have their own formulas that make their own color. And uh, so that's out there. But most of the stuff we're using, we, we purchase. There's a number of companies in the world that make glass color. Yes, do you have a question? How does the sand get into the fire? That's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you what the sand actually looks like. We've got. It's called batch. The batch is the raw materials. So the white powdery substance in here doesn't look like glass because it's not glass yet. This is what I was talking about: silica, soda ash, and lime. It's just this white substance, okay? If you wanted to put colors, you could add the metal oxides directly to this. You take this material and you have a furnace. So this is our furnace and it's off right now. And actually, after the demonstration, if you guys want to come up and look inside, you can. This is the only time of year you, you could actually do that because usually that furnace, when we open the door, it's glowing bright orange and you can feel the heat out there in the audience. So you put this material in the furnace and you put it in maybe like 50 to 100 pounds at a time and then let it start to melt and then put some more in, put some more in, filling it all the way up. Once the furnace is full, you turn it up to 2,350 degrees Fahrenheit. You cook it for about 10 hours and it turns into glass. It'll turn into clear glass or if you had put metal oxides, it'll turn into colored glass and then the glass is inside the furnace. So that's where it comes from. If we're doing glass blowing out here, we have metal, long metal rods and tubes that we go into the furnace and we dip it out, pull it out, and work with it from there. Micah's process here using the glass tubes, remember this tube that I saw? He was actually just telling me that he's been to a factory 
where they make the tubing. And the tubing is uh, it's extruded from a furnace vertically. So the, the, um, the building that it's made in is, how high do you think the whole building is? About four, four stories. About four stories high. On the top of the building is the furnace melting the glass. Now, our furnace holds 500 pounds of glass when it's hot, 500 pounds, 560. Um, the furnaces in these factories hold tons and hundreds of tons of glass. So it's like a swimming pool of glass, okay? Ours is like a little bird bath or a kiddie pool full of glass. They have like Olympic sized swimming pool. Anyway, the glass is above and at the bottom of the furnace, there's some sort of orifice that's allowing glass to pour out and then it's going through some sort of um, former that's giving the wall thickness and the diameter of the tube and it's dropping vertically. And by the time it drops down four stories, all the way down to the ground level, it's cold enough to touch. And there's a person at the very bottom of the drop that's very simply, when it gets down here, scoring it, breaking it off, and piling it up. And all he said that they run it 24 hours a day. And that furnace, once they fire it off, what do you say, three years? Three years. It'll run its whole life, three years straight, 24 hours a day, extruding glass the entire time, and then its, its use is done, and they move on to another furnace. So he says they'll have, side by side, a furnace that's in use and a furnace that's being built or ready to go. And then when the one gets to the end of its life, they switch over and rebuild the other one. Because the thing about glass, molten glass, is uh, some people call it the ultimate solvent. It'll dissolve anything. Molten glass is very, very corrosive, and over time, it'll eat its way through any material. So the furnace that's melting the glass is typically made out of what's called alumina. Alumina is a really, really hard substance. It's a white substance. And if you look in our furnace, all the white kind of brick around the outside of it, and the crucible, the bowl that it's in, is made of alumina, okay? It's a really, really hard substance, but over time, the molten glass eats through the alumina. In fact, our furnace is six years old, and if you take a look in there, you'll see it's eating through the walls of the crucible. And um, over time, at some point, the glass makes its way all the way through, and it's time for a new furnace. Uh, also, the more it eats into the, the, the liner, the crucible and everything, the quality of the glass starts to go down. So you start getting these streaky things called cords, or what we call stones, little actual chunks of the crucible as it breaks apart, start to get into the glass, and that's another indication that it's time to, to rebuild your furnace or start over. So when you turn it off, the glass in there cools, so how do you get it out? So she's saying when you turn off the furnace and the glass cools, how do you get it out? It's easier to get it out when it's hot. So when we turn our furnace off, like for the summer uh, maintenance, we're down for the month of July. We, before we shut it off, we turn our furnace all the way up to 2350 and we take a long ladle, it's like a giant soup ladle, and we scoop all the molten glass out. Because we wouldn't want to leave it in there and then we'd have a solid chunk of glass inside. And in fact, when that glass cools and it expands, it can crack the crucible by, by expanding and pushing against it. So uh, we always take it out when it's hot. And if you if you come take a look after the demo, you'll see there's about a half inch of glass at the very bottom of it, because you can't, it's really impossible to get every last drop out, but we've gotten, you know, 96% of the, the glass out, so. You, question? Have I ever made my own glass? Uh, that's a good question, and come to think of it, not really. I've made my own color before. I've purchased, the, the powder that I showed you, the, the raw materials, and I've purchased metal oxides and mixed those together and then put it in the furnace. But uh, myself, I've never started from scratch, but it'd be very easy to do. You just get um, some sort of recipe. I would ask somebody that has more experience in that and say, hey, could I borrow your recipe? And then there's places that you can order those basic ingredients from, and then you would just put them together and melt them. She's asking about the hardest piece of glass, me or Micah? Um, hardest meaning most complicated or most difficult? Most complicated. 
What's the most complicated piece of glass you ever made? That sewing machine on the poster. Oh, the sewing machine on the poster. Have you seen the posters? Um, you're, it's kind of far from your seat, but there's one hanging up here. So that's a replica of, uh, was it a specific machine? Yeah, it was a Wilcox 1889 hand crank sewing machine. 1889 Wilcox hand crank sewing machine. And Mike, uh, you, did you actually have one to, mm -hmm. to measure and stuff? Yeah. So he had one of these sewing machines. Here, and I'll, I'll grab one of the posters from over here so you can see closer. And he, hey Josh, would you hand me one of the posters with the sewing machines on it? He took measurements off of it, and I'm sure many drawings. And then you can see it's made of a, different, a couple different types of glass, this black glass, and this pinkish glass, pink purple glass. And each one of these parts was made, you know, all these kind of spindly parts separately. And then he started to build the frame and put it all together. And all these parts are welded together. Remember I was talking about how this is similar to welding, where all these connections needed to be fully fused and melted together. But all these curves, those were all bent by hand and then assembled every single part of it. And how long did this take? 300 hours. 300 hours working on this piece of <laughs> And it's beautiful. Well worth it. So there it is. How many days is 300 hours? 24 hours a day? If you work 10 hours a day, it would take you 30 days. A month straight with no weekends. Wow. Pretty cool, huh? Yes. Have any of us ever gotten a first or a second degree burn? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Maybe even worse. The black stuff, so the whole thing is made of glass. So that's black glass and it's uh, purple glass. And the different colors, again, are made by the different metal oxides. Well, I don't think he made it three hour, 300 hours straight. I think he took some breaks. Barely. But, what'd you say? Barely? Barely, yeah. Barely. <laughs> Most difficult? Well, um, I mean, she's asking about what was the most difficult. With glass making, I find that the more you do it, the more natural it becomes. So when you first start, your first piece is incredibly difficult because you're just learning, you know. So it's a, it's a challenge, uh, and then and then that those basic steps to make your basic, you know, whether it's a drinking vessel or whatever, become really second nature, and it's not even difficult at all, and you can do it in your sleep. So I think that idea of how difficult was that to make is pretty relative to the person and how much time they've put into it. So it's kind of hard to gauge um, how difficult something is to make. But I don't know. Would you say that there's a dif most difficult piece? Or? Yeah, it's, it's, everybody has their own. Difficulty. Yeah, so different. everybody has their own things that they struggle with, whether it's... Uh, keeping things perfectly symmetrical or straight, or making things to proportion or something. Everyone has their own things to work out and their own kind of level of difficulties. But it is just like playing a musical instrument. The, the longer you do it, the more you do it, the more natural it becomes and the more second nature. And it's really, when you get to a certain level, uh, you can really create with the material because uh, you're not inhibited by uh, figuring out how to get it to do what you want it to do. Once you know how the glass moves and you can respond to it and, and anticipate how it's going to move, then you can be even more creative and have success. There are limitations to what you can do with the glass, though. Because, after all, it will break at some point. What's that? What was the first glass item that you ever made? Marble. A marble. Yeah, it's a good start. Yes. How do you do what? Out of the furnace. So when the furnace is on, we get it out using long metal rods. We have these long metal rods, we go into the furnace. Have you ever 
seen um, one of those honey dippers? You get honey out of a honey jar. It's like wooden and it's got some like, it's round, but it's got kind of slats. You ever seen one of those? If you take one of those and you go into honey and you turn and you twist as you're coming out of the honey, the honey gathers onto it. And then if you keep turning it, the honey stays on there. If you stop turning, the honey drips off. That is exactly what it's like to get glass out of the furnace. We call it gathering. You gather the glass and then you bring it out. The glass that we took out? Yeah, so when we emptied our furnace at the end of our season, and it's, only, it's, all, it's down for the month of July, um, oftentimes the glass at the very bottom of the, t of the tank has a lot of those kind of cords in it. It's kind of older and you don't necessarily want to remelt it. So a lot of that, we actually, any glass that uh, does not get remelted in our studio, we recycle with a local recycling company. They put it into roads and things like that. They use it as aggregate. Uh, so some of the, the very bottom of the crucible, that glass we're not going to recycle because for that reason. But on a typical um, day when we're up and running, you can see there's two bins over here. One says clear and one says color. All the clear glass goes in the clear bin so that we can throw it back in the furnace. Um, any colored scraps we can't throw in the furnace because they would all mix and then we'd have gray. And it, if you're, you know, it's good to have a, a basis of clear to start with and then you can add any color to it. So the clear is our blank canvas that we add colors to, which is why we keep our furnace only clear. In some uh, places, typically in a factory, they might have 12 different furnaces with a different colored glass in each furnace. And that way they can just get the color molten glass out of the furnace. Yes? Oh, that's a good question. Why aren't his hands burning? So, um, some materials on the planet are known as conductive materials, conductors, and some materials are known as insulators. Um, copper is an example of an incredible conductor. Copper is one of the very best conductors there is. We use it in all of our electricity uh, power lines because it conducts electricity. Electricity travels through it with a very small amount of resistance, right? Um, it also conducts heat. So if you took a copper rod this long and you put it in that flame, got the end of it red hot, the heat would pretty quickly travel all the way down to your hand and you'd be dropping the copper rod. It would conduct that heat. Well, glass is an insulator. It's the opposite of a conductor. And I'm gonna show you in just a moment after he makes this connection. I'm gonna take this rod, I'm gonna get it molten on the end. I'm gonna get it 2,000 degrees. And then I'll show you how close I can get to it before I feel the heat. Thanks, Micah. Okay, so you can see I'm heating it. When I come out, you'll see it's glowing. See it's glowing? It's 2,000 degrees. I'm gonna slide my fingers up. I'm just starting to feel the heat right there. So glass is the most incredible insulator on the planet. That's why we use uh, fiberglass to insulate our homes, right? You have thermoses that are made of, uh, they have a glass insert on the inside. It keeps hot things hot, keeps cold things close, cold. So the heat does not travel. Glass also does not conduct electricity, which is why if you've ever seen on uh, high tension power uh, cables with high voltage, there's glass insulators separating the wire from the actual pole so that the electricity doesn't want to pass through it. An interesting fact though is that glass, when it's hot, it's above 2,000 degrees, it does conduct electricity. I didn't know that until about a year and a half ago. So there's some artists that have been doing some interesting work. In fact, our next third Thursday, our performance uh, we had a performance last night. Next third Thursday, uh, James Akers is going to be exploring some of that. If you heat it up above 2,000 degrees, it does conduct electricity and then that fades away. And he plays with that by passing electricity through it when it's hot and generating sound waves based on the conductivity. So then the sound changes as the conductivity goes away. It's pretty interesting. This little plate he's rolling on there is made of graphite. And we call that a marver. He's using that graphite marver to just shape. So at this point, he's put all of those little parts together. He has one bubble. He's heating it to get a nice, even uh, consistency and wall thickness. He's rolling it on that marver, that graphite marver to shape. 
Was there a question over here? How long has he been working with glass? Micah started in 1999. What year were you born? 2006. So he's been working with glass for about seven years longer than you've been around. But, um, yes. Is what? Oh yeah, she's saying, are the lanterns up here made of glass? Well, the light bulbs inside of them certainly are. The lanterns are made of uh, something else. Do you want to guess what they're made of? Uh, soup cans. Yeah, looks like, uh, I don't know, a tin can of lighter fluid or something. Probably some tuna fish. Paint cans. What, paint cans? All sorts of different types of cans. That's what those are made of. The artist that made those is named Hank Adams. And he lives and works at a place called Wheaton Village up in New Jersey. And he likes to take these cans and he uses a little torch and he burns through the can to create these faces and patterns and stuff. Now these ones are all just empty cans with the light bulbs in them. Uh, sometimes we bring them into the glass studio and drop a glass bubble into them and expand it. And then it's the can with glass inside of it. But these are actually just, just the cans. I'm about to uh, make the, the body shape. Of okay. The bird. So he's about to start shaping out the body of the bird. Up until this point, starting at 10 a.m., everything has been uh, building to create this color pattern. And uh, you can, I'm not sure if you can see on the screen, but it definitely has this sort of looks like the topographical lines on the map. So at this moment, he's going to start, he's referencing his, his drawing over here. He's going to start to, yeah, he's going to start to uh, shape out that bird body. All right. Good? Yeah. And you'll notice that this torch has a uh, wide variety of flames. This is the larger size for getting more glass hot. You can adjust it down to smaller sizes for doing more detailed work. It also has a foot pedal attached. You may have noticed it's pretty convenient. Since he's got two hands on the glass, he can step on the foot pedal and switch from a large flame to a small flame. Hands free. Yeah. What's that? How will he shape the bird? Well, if you just watch closely, you'll see it happen before your eyes. But basically, he's going to heat certain sections. He's pulling, stretching here, and pushing a little there. He also has right now a blow pose. So you see that tube that's attached to the glass that comes around the back of his neck and into his mouth? He can blow into that and inflate the bubble so he can, the, the bird's belly for instance, he can give it a little air and inflate it, make it a little more um, puffed out there. On a level of difficulty, how difficult is it to make this? Um, again, it, it depends on how much practice you have. So for him, he's made, um, I don't know, about a hundred, about a hundred birds. So at this point, it's not probably not that difficult for him because he's done it so many times, you know. Like on a level of difficulty, how difficult is it to ride a bike? I don't know. Have you ever ridden a bike before? I mean, once you've ridden it, it's, you just jump on it and you do it, right? So I'm sure at the earlier stages, like the first couple that he made were the most difficult ones because he had to figure out the steps and figure out the proportions. But then as he's gone through it, it's become uh, less difficult. So you can see he's heating very specific areas. At this point, he's no longer heating the whole tube in the round. He's only heating uh, two sides, perhaps the sides that the wings are on and starting to flatten it. So it's starting to, uh, in the early stages, it was all a symmetrical kind of straight bubble. He's moved away from that into the realm of 
more uh, asymmetrical and sculptural. So I'm guessing that this is going to be the tail, and that is the head. You're starting to see the, the form emerge. Now Micah has these glasses on. They look pretty cool, right? Yeah. They look like cool, you know, sunglasses. His glasses are actually, they have a special coating on them. They're called didinium. And the uh, didinium is two rare earth minerals that are deposited on the glass. They also have a shade on them that makes them a little darker. But when we look at the glass, when he puts it in the flame, it's, it's pretty bright, right? We probably shouldn't stare at it too long. We'll start to see spots. It's not going to hurt your eyes, uh, although you wouldn't want to stare at it all day long, eight hours a day for 40 years of a career, which is why he has those... Uh, spectacles on. The didinium shades take out that really bright soda flavor when, he, when it goes into the flame. So he doesn't see that brightness uh, like we're seeing. Again, making the attachment here and making sure that the, uh, where it went together is nice and hot, flowing together. <clears throat> I had a question about that, if you don't mind, actually. Yeah. I noticed um, when you were sealing one of those to the other that, like, the body that already had a bunch of, uh, like, montages or whatever, you were getting that consistently hotter. Is there a reason for that, or...? Um, so, uh... Glass has a memory. Um, and every time I would seal another line together and then change the axis, it doesn't want to flow back together. And so I have to apply a lot of heat in order to get everything to kind of flow back to be one kind of tube. So that, that massive amount of heat was to try to really force the glass to kind of become, become one. the same one. Yeah. Okay, thank so you. So he was asking about when he puts, uh, he would put a small bubble on instead of like, maybe just getting the one spot hot and melting it, you would get the whole thing hot again. And Micah was saying that if you don't get it above a certain temperature, it has a memory and it has certain, it's not gonna wanna move as one, so you have to build the heat in the whole thing and to get it to kind of behave as one. So he's creating something here, it's, it's called a bridge. He's made a little attachment down here to this tube, and now he's bringing it up and he's gonna attach it to the tip of that last bubble that he just put on there. This is not part of the final sculpture. This is a bridge that's going to be uh, in place while he um, works further on the sculpture, but it'll be removed at some point. And the importance of this bridge is he's going to get this area, the little neck area between those two that he just put together, real hot. And without the bridge, if he got it real hot in there, the little ball on the end would be flopping all over because of gravity, because the glass was hot. Since he has this clear rod here bridging the two, he can get the junction between the two of those as liquidy hot as he wants, but the bridge is going to hold it stable. So it's kind of just holding both sides so he can heat the middle. And bridging is uh, really important when you're putting many, many parts together. There's one artist that works with uh, soft glass the, uh, the soda lime glass and he makes a lot of plant forms and he'll make a little uh, almost like a wheat stalk of wheat and off the tip of every single piece of wheat comes clear and it comes up and it all bridges together so that he can heat everything and melt everything nice and then he removes it all but if you ever see one of his sculptures like in process it looks pretty crazy because all the bridging because of all the parts So you'll notice that he's constantly flipping it up and down. He's flipping. The reason he's flipping is because he's using gravity. As he heats the glass, when it gets molten, it starts to flow down. If he didn't flip it over, it would get really thin where it was stretching away from. So he flips it and it starts falling the other way. He's flipping back and forth. He's also using that blow tube to gently puff and expand. 
the walls of the tube. And then the tool in his hand right now is also made of graphite. It's a graphite paddle. Graphite's a great tool for shaping the glass. It's nice and smooth. It doesn't scratch the glass. You can get graphite pretty hot in the flame and it won't affect it too badly. Question? Has he ever popped one? Um, you ever popped one on accident? Oh yeah. <laughs> when that glass is molten hot, if he accidentally blew a little too hard, it would pop open. Is that what you mean by popping it? Oh yeah, has it ever cracked? So when, when he put this thing together, he made sure that everything melted together nicely and it's all flowing together. But sometimes there could still be stress in there, which could lead to a crack. And cracking is uh, quite common. This will crack before it's over. He says it will crack before it's done. It's part of the process. The cool thing about glass is a lot of times when it cracks, um, you can go in with one of those small flames and you can heal the crack back up and it flows back together and you never even knew it was there. Not always, but sometimes you can fix it up. Is there another question? Did, did you have one? what's inside the, uh, the little thing you're putting the scrap in. So there's two containers out here. This one has water in it. So you may hear a little sizzle when he drops pieces in there. This one is just dry. And it's just scrap. So he's just putting his little scrap pieces in there. Why the water? Because sometimes, let's say he's got a glass rod and it's hot on the end, and there's something on the end that he doesn't want on there anymore. If he dips it in water, it's gonna crack where the water is, and then he can tap it and it'll break off of that spot. So he can use the water to control the temperature as well. Yeah. How big is he made of what? Crack? It, sometimes it all falls apart. Yeah, sometimes the crack could be so big that the whole thing falls apart. Sometimes it's just a little crack and you can just hit it with a torch and it's gone. So as he's working on the, the front here, he can use another piece of glass. He has that clear rod that he touches on and stretches and pulls. He's pulling the beak right now. <coughs> or the front of the face. Where the beak is going to attach. Where the beak will attach. Yeah. See what I mean? Close. You're going to make the beak separate and <coughs> put it on. Is this to the open mouth? I, don't, I think I might try to do that. Some of his drawings have... Uh, the beak is closed, and some of the other ones, the beak is open. So he might try the open mouth on this one. He's hoping to make um, how many of these when you're here? Hopefully two. Hopefully two birds. He's got some other projects he's going to work on too uh, between today and Sunday.
see that pattern. So take a quick look here. You can see the patterning. And what he's going to do, we have a kiln over here that's sitting at 1,000 degrees, 1050. He's going to put it in there and let the whole thing warm up for a while. It's also just about lunchtime. But a little bit later this afternoon, he's going to be constructing um, the wings and other parts in the, in the beak and the wall. Get a symbol. So this piece will come together. Um, he takes a lunch from now until 2.30. Um, so you're welcome to come back later. We'll be posting pictures on the internet. The best way to follow the progress and stuff is to check our Facebook page, the Christ Museum Glass Studio. Any other questions at this moment? Any specific questions for Micah? Covered it all pretty well. Thanks so much for coming in. Come check back on his progress. He's also giving a lecture on Sunday at 4 o'clock. Slide lecture right here in this space about his life and his work and his travels and everything. So I hope you guys can join us for that. It's all free. And have a great afternoon. Thank you.